Mere Hay, a quiet and apparently tranquil suburb of Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire. In one house on smart and comfortable Waterdale Grove, a couple are celebrating their anniversary. Lee and Kate Knight have been married for seven years. A special meal to mark this special day has been carefully prepared. Kate has arranged for Lee to have his favourite food. Curry, accompanied by a full-bodied red wine. Lee has it all. A beautiful home, a son upon whom he dotes, and a rock-solid job as a team leader making excavators with JCB. He has no way of knowing all is about to be shattered. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Days after the meal, Lee is rushed into emergency surgery. He sinks into a coma. His survival hangs in the balance. The Darleston a former coaching inn just outside Stoke in the late 90s. Kate, who was 19, worked here. Lee, her future husband, was a customer. The first time I saw Kate, she was working in, in a mum and stepdad's pub. I, I thought, oh, she's a nice little kid. <laughs> so, um, every time I went into the pub, I'd, I'd make sure that I spoke to Kate. And I knew that she had a boyfriend at the time. Um, when I found out that she split up with her boyfriend, I, I thought I'd, I'd ask her if she wanted to go out. We pretty much saw each other every night after that. The relationship blossomed swiftly. She was very outgoing. She, she liked the things I like. We like the same music. We like to go to the same places. Um, she was very, I suppose you call it, bubbly. We, we always laughed and moved together. But when Lee took Kate home to meet his mum, Annette, another side to Kate emerged. I do like people make themselves at home and my own, but not on the sort of first visit. She came in the house, opened the kitchen cupboard doors. What can we have for tea? I thought, oh dear, my goodness. She liked uh, the last say and everything. Very domineering. From the start, it was clear Kate wanted to move up in the world. She started night school. She took bookkeeping exams, which she said she was successful in. Um, and as it turned out through the inquiry, financial gain was an important part of her life and what she was motivated by. In 1998, Lee and Kate Knight got married. The wedding was brought forward because she was pregnant with their son. We were both very excited. We only had the wedding at, at the registry office in Hanley, but it was, it was a brilliant day. There's lots of people there who we both knew. They moved into a terraced house, but it was clear this was not good enough for Kate. She always said she didn't want to live in a terraced house. It was like, no, we won't go live in the country. Which, you know, everybody does, don't you? Oh, we've got this now, when we move again, we want to move on to something better. Lee was working hard up to seven days a week to keep his wife happy. He was a team leader at JCB in Roaster, Staffordshire. He earned 500 pounds a week in take-home pay. I was happy to earn 50 to 55 hours a week uh, to support my wife and my son, and uh, keep the house that we got and the cars and everything. We never really had a lot of money, but if we needed anything, we'd always got enough money to buy anything. Among his workmates, Lee was a respected figure. He was hard-working, very, very popular. 
Lee was the kind of person who you could rely on. He would never, he would never let you down. But as hard as Lee may have been working, living within her means was not within Kate's makeup. Everything was disposable or replaceable. Everything was a bit easy come, easy go, you know. Um, the furniture, you don't look after it. Oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter. We can have another one. Which is fine if you've got the money. Kate developed a hunger for money which was to change her life and Lee's forever. Whilst Lee Knight was hard at work earning money to support his son and his wife Kate, she was left in charge of the finances and she was showing less appetite for work. She'd start a job She'd be there two, three weeks, and she'd come in, oh, they're making me manager. Well, you know, nobody makes a, a manager of a person when they've only been there three weeks. But she'd only last three months, three and a half months, at the very most, at any job, and then she'd finish or be finished, we don't know. Eventually, she told certain friends she'd fallen off a chair and was unable to work. But to others, she said she'd been appointed by a company to work from home as a bereavement counsellor. She said she was working for a company called Babcom. But I found out there's no such company and she hasn't worked for three years. Well, it's not nice being lied to, especially by your wife. The Kate's world was, was somewhat different than the real world out there. She was um, best described as a fantasy system in respect of what she was telling people was going on and really what actually was going on. Didn't believe anything, what she said, you know, unless you saw it, you don't believe it, you know. She was just a, a liar, a fantasiser, you know. But through Lee's hard work and overtime, the Knights were able to move upmarket into the comfortable suburb of Mere Hay and a smart house on Waterdale Grove at a cost of £65,000. It was brilliant. It just felt better. It was a three bedroom, seven detached house on Mere Hay. It was a new house, it was only about three years old. It's a nice neighbourhood, we've got nice, nice people that are living around us. Not long after we moved in, uh, Kate became pregnant again. But uh, after about six weeks, she, she said she'd had a, a miscarriage. But I, I think that, I felt that brought us closer. After that, we, we brought a puppy. So it was, it was, we used it take him out for walks a lot, all three of us together. And I, I thought it was just normal life, that's, that's, that's how things go. But Kate still wasn't satisfied. Soon she was putting her lying skills to new use, forging Lee's signature to extend the mortgage to £125,000 and take out a string of other secret loans. You could see her financial motivation in the loans that she took out. She wasn't working herself, so she had to use Lee's name. In fact, the people who arranged the loans never actually saw Lee, and he never knew about them. Kate made sure it stayed that way. She kept the paperwork out of sight. As far as debt was concerned, I didn't think we had any. I just don't know where the money went at all. Never fully answered. Some of the money uh, was used to refinance some of the later loans. Um, and there seemed to be no, no rhyme or reason, really. There was uh, a loan taken out with one bank, and at the same time, she was under pressure to repay a loan with the other bank. So you used a chunk of the, the new loan to satisfy the old lenders. And to explain the fact that she now sometimes had ready cash, Kate invented another cover story. 
She told Lee that um, she was working, she's employed in the call centre, and therefore she'd be getting paid cash in hand. Lee, previously to this, at this time, was uh, giving her X, X hundreds of pounds each week to pay for the housekeeping and your normal household bills. But then Kate said she'd got a job, so Lee no longer had to do that. As part of her strategy of hiding evidence of the loans from Lee, Kate said there was a problem with the post. She arranged to collect her mail directly from the sorting office so he would never see the unpaid bills. But as debts mounted, she grew increasingly desperate about how she could pay them off. Then, fatefully, she had an idea. Kate must have realised that the answer to her financial problems was right in front of her, that if Lee died, she stood to gain at least £140,000 from JCB in an insurance payout. That amount would bring security and leave her free to build a new life with her son. But Lee showed no sign of dying of his own accord, so Kate decided to help him along. She started a, a course of action which she was clearly committed to uh, in order to attempt to kill her husband and claim on the life insurance from JCB. The idea of claiming the life insurance must have played on her mind, it must have festered there. It must have been a fantasy initially, but there must have come a point where it tipped over into reality. Bizarrely, Kate took into her confidence a neighbour called Sarah Johnson, who lived three doors down the street. It's hard to believe that anybody who was actually thinking of killing their husband would tell their friend and neighbour all about it and how they were going to do it. It's strange. Why? Why would she tell if? Why would she tell anybody? But she did. It started with an extraordinary request. Initially, Kate approached Sarah and asked her if she knew a hitman. She said that there was £50,000 in it for Sarah if she did know one. Well, clearly, Sarah was amazed to be asked this question and, and uh, initially didn't take it seriously, as I don't think you would. To start with, she, she said, my friend needs a hitman it in that type of context. But it became very clear to Sarah very, relatively soon that it was a fact. She herself she was talking about. Sarah just thought it was fantasy. Kate explored other ways of getting rid of Lee. Kate had been searching online about the effects of ecstasy. She'd actually typed in, how fatal can eight pills be? Kate claimed in a conversation with Sarah that she'd got 10 ecstasy tablets and that she was going to feed them to Lee during the course of a day when they were going up to Liverpool to visit her mum. It was Kate's intention to put the ecstasy tablets into Lee's drink and this was the first hint that, uh, of poisoning that we, we heard of in the inquiry. At about this time, Lee had a couple of days off work. I said to Kate, have you given me drugs? Because I felt... I don't know, it's, I felt ill, really ill. And she started to cry and said, so why would I give you drugs? I, I wouldn't give you drugs, I love you. And so she cried and cried and so I, I thought I'd just, I was just ill, but I, I couldn't sleep. And then it happened again. Kate had done me a Coca-Cola with me tea and I got this ill feeling again. Kate's intentions were about to become more explicit. She and Sarah visited the chemists. Kate had a conversation with the pharmacist and the chemist about liquid iron solution or iron tablet. Hi, can I help you? Hi, yes. Um, I'm wondering if you can help me. Do you sell liquid iron? The chemist, Andrew Picard, testified at Kate's trial. In the conversation I had with, with Kate, the concerns that I have with something like this is obviously making sure that uh, the person who it's for knows exactly what dose to take. Obviously in uh, overdosage then 
iron preparations can be poisonous. The problem was, Kate was vague about who'd be taking the iron. At first, she suggested it would be herself, but then she changed her story. Kate's nan was dead, and Sarah knew it. Sarah challenged Kate about the fact that her nan had passed away. And it became clear to Sarah in that conversation that Kate was intent upon the course of action that she'd previously told her about. Kate justified it by saying that she'd received the money from JCB, she'd be able to settle the mortgage, she'd have the house, and she and her son would be happy. But liquid iron, especially in the necessary quantities, would be hard to disguise. Kate appears to have rejected it as a potential poison, but something was affecting Lee's health. I was really sick. I, I was like, detached all the time, it was strange. People around me kept saying, you're not right, you should go home and should have some time off, but I, I thought it was just the flu, so I carried on as normal. The truth may have been far more sinister. Sarah Johnson came round to Kate's for coffee. Kate produced a bottle of antifreeze from the cupboard under the kitchen sink and asked Sarah to smell it, which she did. Sarah described it smelling as a strong chemical smell. She then pulled out a bottle of wine and asked Sarah to smell that. She said it had got a diesel, petrol kind of smell to it. And then Kate told Sarah that she'd already put antifreeze into that bottle of wine, which she'd smelled. Incredibly, Sarah said that she actually tasted it. She said she didn't know why she did it. She felt overpowered by Kate, and it was like a dream. Sarah said she could only taste wine. Kate said she'd been researching the effects of antifreeze online. Kate then said that she was going to poison Lee's curry that night and she said she'd also done it the night before and Lee complained that it had got a, a tinny taste to it. Harmless enough outside the body, antifreeze, which contains ethylene glycol, is converted into acids if ingested with potentially lethal effect. Professor Robert Forrest is a toxicologist who gave evidence at Kate Knight's trial. It's not that ethylene glycol itself is poisonous. It is what it is converted into in the body that's poisonous. The final acid that it produces is stuff called oxalic acid, kettle cleaner, and it combines with calcium in your blood to form calcium oxalate crystals, which are deposited in your kidney, in your brain, and in other places like the lining of your gut. The crystals can cause dramatic damage. This is a section of kidney looked at under the microscope from a person who has died as a result of ethylene glycol poisoning. And the striking feature is these crystals of ethylene glycol which are deposited in the kidney and which can be seen very clearly. The crystals cause kidney failure. Elsewhere in the body they trigger brain damage, blindness, deafness and bleeding from the gut. A simple experiment shows how lethally reactive the acid is with the calcium found in every cell of the human body. One beaker contains oxalic acid solution, the other a calcium solution. And what we're looking for is some cloudiness. So this cloudiness is calcium oxalate crashing out a solution. If I pour it through filter paper, you'll be able to see the actual crystals themselves. And it's these crystals of oxalic acid that are so damaging to the body. In the Knight household, the devastating effects of those chemical reactions were about to be unleashed. April the 4th, 2005, 
the most likely date upon which Lee was poisoned. It's Kate and Lee's seventh wedding anniversary. Kate is preparing dinner. I was looking forward to it in the day. I think I finished work a bit earlier that night to, to get home. The couple have decided on takeaway curry and red wine. I thought she loved me. We were very close together, we were very good together. But love is not what Kate has in mind. Well, ethylene glycol starts off, it tastes sweet. It's mildly intoxicating, so you feel as if you're drunk. Every sip of wine and every mouthful that Lee took sent him further down a slope which led to the edge of death. Antifreeze is potentially lethal. Half a cupful is enough to kill anybody. And if you don't get prompt treatment, I'm afraid the outlook's really bleak. It wasn't long before the poison took hold. But Lee's condition was to mystify doctors, and without swift diagnosis and treatment, he could die. For their seventh wedding anniversary dinner, Kate Knight added a special ingredient to the curry she was preparing for her husband. Lee Knight had hurried home from his work at JCB to be with her. Kate had been researching the potentially lethal effects of antifreeze on the body. Lee went to work for the first two days of the week and then reported sick, which in itself was a rarity because his uh, attendance record at JCB was uh, virtually 100%. Uh, he then became very unwell, which falls in line with the anniversary meal being an attempt by Kate to poison him. I've got really bad stomach pains and I kept on being sick. Um, everything that I, I had to drink, I was just I was sick again. And uh, I said, I need to go see the doctor, my stomach's really hurting. Five days after the dinner, Lee was admitted to University Hospital, North Staffordshire. He was in a bad way. His head was lolling around. He couldn't breathe properly. He hadn't urinated for several days, which was a clear indication of kidney problems. To save his life, doctors had to carry out a procedure which would wash away vital evidence. When the doctors discovered that Lee's kidneys weren't functioning, they very quickly put him on a dialysis machine, which replaces the function of the kidneys and cleans the body. However, at the same time as cleaning the body, any evidence that was inside Lee at that time would have been cleaned away by the dialysis treatment. So that became an issue when the police became involved in the inquiry. Lee was too ill to realise, but the cause of his illness was still a mystery. I didn't really know what was going on. It was just things happening around me. So it was really scary. The doctors were treating him for, for every symptom that they could see, but as to the cause of his condition, they didn't know. The doctors were initially baffled about exactly what was wrong with Lee. His condition was getting worse. Facial paralysis was setting in. His hearing was starting to go. His condition was getting really bad. On the fourth day in hospital, events took a dramatic turn for the worse. Lee began hemorrhaging from a duodenal ulcer. Acids from the antifreeze had eaten into his living tissue. The bed was just oozing with blood. I couldn't even be looking down and there was blood everywhere. Loads and loads of blood. And I think, I don't know if I passed out or something, and I'd, the next thing I remember, it's, it's like four months later, I was quite upset and alarmed, like, and the nurses came running and I passed out. Lee needed emergency surgery to cauterise the ulcer. If they operated, there'd only be a 60% chance of him surviving because he was losing so much blood. Without the operation, he'd die anyway. So, uh, sent for his family. So we went to pick Kate up 
and they were met with a father-in-law uh, out in the bedroom window and said, she's only just gone to bed. He says, but I'll wake her up, we'll be up there as soon as possible. Well, she never came. She never came, we never saw her. Lee was um, underwent surgery for the, for the bleed that, that wouldn't stop bleeding. Uh, he had received blood transfusions um, and as a result of the operation, um, they managed to cauterise the, the ulcer, which they ultimately discovered was the cause of the bleed. Um, and then he was in intensive care thereafter. But at the time, it was a you know, very scary time for the family. Lee had now sunk into a coma. I felt as if my world had fell apart. I just couldn't take it in that he could, he could go, you know. I welled him back. I really welled him back. I talked to him constant. Um, I rubbed his arms. I, well, I talked to him, I sang to him. I wouldn't let him go, nor if I could help it, he wasn't going to leave me. In the struggle to reach a diagnosis, doctors took a biopsy of Lee's kidney. The telltale crystals which indicate antifreeze or ethylene glycol poisoning showed up, but the results were inconclusive. This is a kidney biopsy, a tiny core, not much thicker than a human hair, of Lee's kidney, which was taken when the doctors were trying to work out what had happened to him. You can see there's only three crystals obvious in that tiny section of kidney. Far fewer than in a sample taken from someone who died without the crystals being washed away by dialysis. There was always going to be a problem for the prosecution who are going to have to differentiate his kidney from the classical appearance that you see in a kidney taken at post-mortem when somebody has died as a result of ethylene glycol poisoning. One of the doctors suggested that ethylene gly glycol poisoning may be responsible for the condition that Lee was in due to the presence of various crystals in Lee's kidney. Um, but because ethylene glycol poisoning is 99% as far as the medics were concerned, seen with people who self-harm, then they discounted it because that is not what they believe they were looking at with Leonard. Just after the doctors had done a biopsy on Lee, Kate bumped into her neighbour, Sarah Johnson, in the street. According to Sarah, Kate said that a plan had worked, that nothing had shown up on the biopsy, and that if she hadn't have called an ambulance, Lee would have been a goner. And then she added, damn. At this point, Sarah, still believes that Kate's fantasising about these things, making it up as she goes along, if you like. Then something happened which brought it home to Sarah Johnson that this wasn't fantasy at all. She bumped into Lee's cousin. They chatted for a little while before Sarah asked Lee's cousin how Lee was because Sarah hadn't seen him for a while. Lee's cousin said that he was in a hospital, seriously ill. The doctors had no idea what was the problem with him, uh, and he was in intensive care. Sarah was clearly horrified. Um, she um, immediately told Lee's cousin what Kate had said to her. Obviously, all Kate dropped into place for her at that point. The cousin immediately called Lee's family. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Um, when my niece told me, I thought, what do we do? Suppose it isn't true, and um, we go and tell somebody what's it going to cause, the biggest row anybody could have in the family. I thought, you couldn't, no way could she have done this. But we ran the hospital, and they said, come up straight away, which we did. And the doctor took us in a room with the sister, I said, could this be what was wrong with Lee? And he stood up and he said, my advice to you is go to the police and go now. And he never said nothing else. He walked out of the room. I myself went round to Kate's address uh, and arrested for the attempted murder of her husband, Lee. She uh, was clearly made a lot of noise and was seemingly upset about the allegation being made against her. but she was making a lot of noise without shedding a tear. Police searched the house. 
we recovered from the cupboard under the sink a nearly full canister of Tesco home brand antifreeze. It turned out there was, there was literally 160 mils missing from the litre bottle. That's about a cupful, and the experts reckon you only need about half a cupful to kill you. Lee had no idea the canister existed. I don't know how we got the... I'd, I'd never buy antifreeze from Tesco's. Police found handbags stuffed with paperwork relating to loans and the thousands of pounds of debt run up by Kate. Kate told us that it was the first time that she'd seen the documentation that we produced. She told us that uh, Lee was in charge of the household finances uh, and that she'd never seen the final demand letters or the letters from the loan companies. Lee has maintained throughout it was Kate who handled the bills. I didn't know anything about any debt. Apparently, I found out since I came out of hospital, uh, she, she wasn't paying any of the household bills. Police also seized the computer. They found Kate had tried to hide her internet searches, but investigators were able to unscramble the information. There are certain moments in the inquiry when I, I knew we were onto something. One of those was Kate had committed herself during the interview to saying that she'd used the computer to research the Lee's symptoms, but only after Lee had been hospitalised. But police could prove this was a lie. Kate had been researching the effects of antifreeze, ecstasy and liquid iron before Lee was taken ill. There was enough evidence to take Kate to court. At the initial hearing, she denied attempted murder and was allowed out on bail. She moved to the Wirral, taking her son and a whole lot more. Annette found Kate emptying the house of furniture. They had a phone call off a neighbour that she was emptying the house. I'm not a vicious person, but I'm so angry and hurt. I caught a taxi and went across. While I was horrible, I was the most horriblest person. I shouted, I called it, I swore at it. If I'd got it in me, I'd have killed it that day for taking my son's furniture. For emptying his own, what he'd worked hard for. After being in a coma for 10 weeks, Lee regained consciousness. But his sight, hearing and kidneys were damaged forever. I wake up to find out that my wife had tried to kill me. I must have been able to hear what people were saying. Um, uh, when I woke up, the, the first thing I, I said apparently was I asked my mum if Kate had done this to me. Uh, that, that was the first time I was, I was aware of it, really. Uh, then, then people gradually told me what, what was happening. and I, I was gutted. I was, I was devastated. Very upsetting. It still, it still upsets me now. But his family was simply overjoyed he'd pulled through. A really happy, happy day. Like, you know, he, he, he wasn't out of the woods by a long chalk, but he, he wasn't in intensive care and he wasn't on the critical list. The nurses cheered, the doctors cheered, because they never thought he'd have gone out, gone out of that ward. Not alive, anyway. However, the antifreeze was continuing its evil work on Lee's nervous system, senses and brain. When I first woke up, I could see and hear. Um, and I think it took a few weeks for, for my eyes and ears to stop working. It was really scary because it, nobody could communicate with me. They used to have to write it in block capitals on my hands. And that, that was really hard to learn, that was. I used to cry a lot that the nurses on, on Ward 29 were, were brilliant with me. You know, they, they used to come in and just hold me on to stop me being upset. Um, yeah, they were really good to me. The damage ran deep. Doctors established Lee's sight and hearing would never recover. Once again, the family were devastated. Absolutely gutted, because we'd kept thinking, it'll come back, it'll come back. 
you know, and that's what we kept holding on to, it'll come back. But when they said, no, it definitely won't, won't. Well, you think about him before yourself, you know, how's he going to take it? But his tickets on the chin. But there was still no forensic proof that Kate had caused this damage. It was always going to be a difficult thing. I knew that we faced a challenge during the trial, proving how and where Kate had poisoned Lee. It was touch and go whether Kate would be convicted. Late 2007, and at Stafford Crown Court, the trial of Kate Knight is imminent. She's accused of attempting to murder her husband, Lee, by poisoning him with antifreeze. But he's been left blind and deaf, potentially a major problem in terms of giving evidence in court. The Cochlear Implant Centre in Manchester is rushing his case through, so he'll be able to hear in time for the trial. OK, then, Lee, we're ready. OK. The buckets hold water. The buckets hold water. He listens to his father. He listens to his father. OK, good. The room's getting cold. The woman's getting cold. Lee's been given two cochlear implant hearing aids. The cochlear implant has a, a microphone, as a hearing aid would do, and that is where the external sound is picked up. That's then analysed and processed by this part of the, the implant. That information then goes across the skin by radio frequency to the internal implant, and the brain interprets that as sound. They're fantastic. I, I come from hearing no sound at all to hearing everything. Um, I can have proper conversations again. So it's a fantastic, massive difference. But even with Lee able to testify, there was no guarantee of conviction. The police faced particular challenges in this case. There were no eyewitnesses, the forensic evidence wasn't conclusive, and an example of that was the biopsy that the doctors took on Lee. The oxalate crystals that form with ethylene glycol poisoning were really minimal. Lack of medical evidence which could only have been caused by antifreeze was just one problem for the prosecution. We'd never definitively proved when Kate had poisoned Lee, um, but the case was more than just the medical case. There were far more um, types of evidence that we were bringing forward to the court, the computer, and the evidence of the witnesses who came to court as well. The defence tried to suggest Lee's illness had been due to heavy drinking. I, I didn't go out drinking with my mates a lot. We, we probably go out four or five times a year at the most. <laughs> Sometimes we, we, we'd go for a quarry, but the, the, the women had come with us, so okay to be there. Uh, I used to have some, some kinds of lager in the house, but... I was never de dependent on it, like Kate tried to say that I was. Um, I never had to have time off work for being drunk or anything like that. The prosecution kept Lee away from court till he gave evidence. They hoped his condition would have a dramatic effect on the jury of ten women and two men. I was so positioned in court that I could see the jury rather than seeing Lee enter the court. Uh, and his, his entry did make seem to make an impact with the jury. He is the ultimate gentle giant, and that very much came across when he gave his evidence in court. After two days of deliberation, the jury returned a unanimous verdict of guilty. As Kate was led away to await sentence, a friend rang Lee, who was with his sister-in-law, to give him the news. He said she's been found guilty. And we, we both cheered. <laughs> we were outside Tesco cheering, waiting for a taxi. It was brilliant. This also meant Lee would at last be reunited with his nine year old son, who had previously been living with Kate. 
then I realised that he was going to be here living with us, so I was really, really excited. It was brilliant. Really tough, it was brilliant. I won't say no more. For the first time since his illness, Lee has returned to JCB to be reunited with his former colleagues. This is the first time Lee's been back, and as you can see, he was just really, really popular with, with the people who he was team leading over. How are you doing? All right, All right, The devastation he caused with his, with his work colleagues, once they found out, they, 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 they took it quite hard. I was a bit nervous because obviously I haven't seen anybody, any of them for like nearly three years. But it was brilliant. They're, they're, they're a good bunch of people, everybody here. There's brighter news in other areas of Lee's life too. The poisoning left him needing dialysis three times a week but his brother Michael has offered one of his kidneys so Lee can have a transplant. What can I say about Michael? <laughs> He's given me a big part of his body. Uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to say thank you enough for it. Um, I, he's going to have a nice score for me, which he didn't have before. I was, I was going to say his thanks. If there's anything I can do to help him, I will do. I'm so proud of Michael. He's taking everything with a pinch of salt, you know. He'll say to Lee, I'm going on holiday this weekend, I'm taking your kidney with me, is it all right? <laughs> and Lee'll say to him, Don't get drinking, don't make a mess of my kidney. <laughs> and that's how they joke about it, as if they just give him one another, you know, a birthday present. Well, I mean, it's a gift to life, it's, it's, it's going to make such a difference to Lee's life. And uh, well, I am terrified. Hi, Lee. Just Hi, checking yeah. you're okay. Are you comfy okay. there? Just check your arm. Yeah. But as they wait to hear whether a transplant is feasible, Kate comes up for sentencing. Okay, then, Lee. Thanks. See you in a bit. Okay, sure. I'm going to suffer for all my life. Obviously, I don't think she'll get a life sentence. Um, I'd like to see her serve at least 10 years. But the judge describes Kate as a fantasist who callously and mercilessly watched her husband Lee become desperately ill and said nothing to help. As she weeps in the dock, he sentences her to 30 years. For the media, this has been a big story. Despite her scheming, Knight left a trail of evidence which, through detailed investigation, we were able to build into a strong case, resulting in her prison sentence today. I've been covering courts for over 30 years and that's the heaviest fixed sentence that I've ever heard passed. The judge said that it was meant to be a deterrent, and I think it was a deterrent sentence. The judge was very clear when sentencing to explain his reasons for sentence, and he went into detail about the aggravating factors, the research that she put into the offence, the lack of remorse that she has shown, the fact that well, she had the knowledge that would have assisted the medics in treating her husband. I was ecstatic that she did get 30 years. I expected her to get 10 years at the most. Uh, and when I, when I heard that she got 30, I was really pleased. Uh, it keeps out of mind and my son's life for a long time, hopefully. And uh, lets him get used to things as they are now. Lee is rebuilding his life. Don't get me wrong, he's been upset on occasions and he gets frustrated uh, a lot, like, you know, but he took any, how anybody can take what he's been through and being blind and deaf on top of it is beyond me. I don't know, I don't know how he's took it. He's took everything in his stride. You know, and it takes one hell of a bloke to do that. I don't think there's many more that could do it, you know, but that's Lee. Lee now has a girlfriend, the nurse who's been giving him dialysis. JCB are continuing his sick pay, and he's learned the kidney transplant can go ahead. But the spectre of Kate will always be with him. I, I, I tried not to think about Kate at all. Um, 
in the pit of my stomach. I, I hated it for it. I, 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 how could somebody do this to somebody they claimed that they loved? I just wanted her to pay for what she's done. I don't, I don't want harm to come to her because that would be too easy. I want her to be in prison for a long time so that she suffers. I mean, I'm going to suffer the rest of my life.